in the news today and yesterday and for the last 11 months and probably for the next foreseeable future, a lot is going on. There have been some highly sophisticated attacks on Hezbollah operatives. These explosions have been damaging to the entire Hezbollah communications network and, of course, left a lot of their commanders out of commission. So what does this mean for the residents living on the Israeli side? A lot of people have been evacuated from the north border. There's a buffer now of about three kilometers, 1.8 miles or something like that, just south of that buffer zone, just three miles in, five miles in. There's still a lot of people living there. There's still a lot of kids that are trying to go to school every day. And when there's rockets flying in from over the hills, these kids just stop, drop, and roll. There's not enough bomb shelters for them to hide in. I've shared other stories about bomb shelters in the center of the country, in the south of the country, how they help and how they've saved families from direct impacts on their apartments. This situation up north is actually very different. One, because of the proximity of the incoming rockets. When that alarm sounds and you only have three seconds to find shelter, there's not very far that you can run. That's the immediate danger, of course. Also, the northern communities haven't had as much rocket action over the years. It was the south, it was Gaza shooting all the rockets. Hezbollah had not done as much damage until about 11 months ago when the war started and Hezbollah started shooting daily rockets. They've shot more than 3,000 rockets over the last year. Most of those, of course, fall onto the fence communities. There's actual kibbutzes and communities that have their perimeter fence on the border with Lebanon. But lately, over the last month or so, Hezbollah rockets have been hitting further and further south. So these Israeli communities on the Lebanon border, they haven't had as much history with the rockets flying in. Maybe because it was relatively safer than in, in the south kibbutzes, the communities are bigger. There are 1,200 people, 1,500 people, but there's only a couple of bomb shelters for the whole community. So multiple organizations have been working there to install bomb shelters for these communities. I was there, I've been there multiple times with the different projects. And it's a big all day project. It's coordinated with Home Front Command, uh, with the army, with uh, the local uh, civil defense teams. Basically, it's a big box made of reinforced concrete. It comes in a, on a big truck, flatbed. There's a crane that picks it up and sets it in place. There's like 10 people working together, somebody from the army, somebody from the, the local uh, security team, the, the truck driver, the crane operator, his uh, assistants. I'm there filming this thing. So one of the days that we were there working, it was Holocaust Remembrance Day. And people know that at a specific point and during the day, there's gonna be a, a moment of silence for the whole country. Everybody stops. There's uh, cars driving on the street and on highways, traffic stops, everybody gets out of their car and there's a minute of silence. Everybody stands there listening to the sound the wailing of, of the siren for a minute to remember the victims of the Holocaust and, and pay respects. The reason people stop in traffic is because they don't, nobody sits there waiting for that siren. It's kind of like, well, it's going to come. But you're still running errands and doing things and working and kind of catches you, at least me, it catches off guard every time. Same thing here. We're working. There's 10 people there. We're all working and the siren stops. What's interesting, from the officer that's there to the crane operator, they're all Arabs. So when the siren starts wailing, I'm off to the side from where the work is happening, trying to be in a place where it's a little more quiet. And I'm doing an interview, a, a stand-up. So I turn around to see the work crew, and frankly, I wouldn't have judged them if they continued to work because it's a type of thing where if it's if the, the thing is up in the air, however many tons is over your head, you don't want to leave it there even for a minute. I would have completely understood if they continued working. They stopped. Every one of them was standing there with their heads bowed, paying respects to the fallen in the Holocaust. And for me, that was such a big deal because these are all Israeli Arabs. They understand what it means being part of this community. They're working for this community. They're, installed. they're not just doing their job. They're not just there to get a paycheck. They're there to provide a service. And in the midst of doing this good work for the community that, they're, that they came to visit, they also stop and pay respects to, to the victims. Arabs are a big part of this community. And... Most of them, are, there's, there's outliers and there's crazies everywhere. But most of these Arabs, I don't know if you can say that they love Israel, but they respect and they're, they want to live as part of the community. They don't want to fight. They don't want to be independent. And if you ask them on the street, would you want to live in Gaza or in Palestine instead of Israel proper? 95% of them would say no. 
or Jordan for that matter, or anywhere else in the Arab nations. They have their freedoms. They can choose to be part of this community or not be part of this community. And some do choose not to be part of this community. But in this case, all 10 of them stood there and paid their respects. And at least on that occasion, they were part of the community. So I don't know if it was peer pressure, somebody started it and everybody followed, but that's kind of how it works. Peer pressure is the reason that there's a war. Peer pressure from Iran, peer pressure from those that hate, peer pressure from those that want war, peer pressure all over the place, propaganda, peer pressure from the news and so on and so on. That's what's happening in the universities. That's what's happening in the rallies. But there's a lot of people that don't pay attention to that. And that's the reason we can still live. And that's the reason that people on the North border are still there, even though there's no protection in the street and they're three seconds away from a rocket impact. So these preventive operations that are happening in Lebanon right now, they're ways to minimize the extent of the war with Lebanon. There's many ways to fight a war. And I believe that this is a smarter thing to do, even though Israel gets condemned for doing this. Speaking of peer pressure, there's voices out there that have called Israel out on being a terrorist state for doing something like this. They've called this attack indiscriminate and it, it puts in danger other people. I don't mean to sound crass and I don't, and, and every casualty is, is horrible. And I get it, war is horrible, war is nasty, and there's a lot of tactics that can be questioned. But we're dealing with terrorists that have been hidden all these communities for a year. They kind of had it coming. Again, what does this mean for the people living in these communities on the Israeli side? Will they need to evacuate? Will this escalate the war? Will the, there's a lot of questions. The answer is nobody knows. The other answer is people are not leaving. People are staying there, and this is the way that they, they fight off the enemy, by being there and by continuing to live their lives. All we can do is help them get through it by donating shelters, by being a part of that community, by supporting. And it doesn't matter who you are, Arab, Christian, Jew, we've seen some amazing examples of people supporting each other. That's all it takes to get through this war. I hope that there's a takeaway in all of this from you. If you've learned something from this video, give it a like. Or give it a dislike if you hated it. But let me know why you disliked it. Let's start a conversation. And come back tomorrow, I'll tell you another story.